Hi and welcome back to 8-Bit Resurgence. Today we're going to be restoring and upgrading a Commodore D9060 hard drive. So if that sounds interesting to you, stay tuned and we'll get into it. So this is the drive that we're talking about today. It's a drive that I bought um, almost four years ago and it was one of those eBay specials, um, untested drives. And we all know what untested means on eBay. It means broken for the most part anyway, and uh, at least that's my experience. Um, so I started bidding on it and I was the high bidder because I really wanted one of these drives. Ended up paying $898 for it, another hundred bucks shipping, and it was mine. So then the wait started. Uh, didn't take too long. You know, global shipping program for Canada is like three weeks, something like that. But to my disappointment when I got it, the box looked awful small. And it turns out that the guy had managed to find a box exactly the same size as the drive there was no padding in it at all uh, just a skiff of cardboard around it and the drive inside um, these things weigh a ton and uh, i was afraid oh it probably got dropped things always get dropped in shipping and sure enough um, this thing had taken a face plant somewhere along the way and this corner down here you can't see the picture. I'll take a picture and insert it here. Um, the bottom corner had folded in. Uh, these cases, unlike the MSD cases, which are, you know, it's an all metal case, and this has a similar kind of um, metal case around the, the top and sides. Um, the MSD ones are just a single layer of, of metal. The 9060 and the 9090 drives, they have a folded edge, so it's double metal around the edge, and that thing was folded in. Um, it was very disappointing. Otherwise, the drive, from the pictures anyway, they it looked really nice. Um, yeah, granted, it was untested, so it probably didn't work anyway, but given the impact damage on the front and later I discovered it had hit so hard that the transformer inside it's mounted by um, four really heavy standoffs um, the whole transformer had shifted forward and those standoffs had bent so it took a really hard hit uh, so I figured well I didn't want I'm not gonna plug it in it was a 220 volt unit so I'd have to use my step-up transformer that I, I purchased years ago for testing um, equipment you know, from the EU that I get occasionally. Um, so I, I had the right voltage, you know, we're in Canada, we're 110 volts. This thing was 220, still made in the States, but probably for the uh, European market. Um, but I wasn't about to power it on. Having taken the hit that it did, uh, I really needed to be sure that everything was okay with it. And I didn't have the time at the time that I bought it, so I went on to a shelf. And then one thing leads to another in, in one's life, and I never got back to it. Uh, but this year I decided I'm going to take on some of those projects that I put away on a shelf and forgotten about. And the... D9060 that I bought is one of those uh, drives that needs to be repaired. I, I've always wanted one. Uh, I had one back around the early 90s. Uh, did a lot purchase from somebody local, but this thing looked like it had been sitting in someone's damp basement for 20 years. It was in really bad shape, really badly rusted. Uh, Back then I was more into cars, so I didn't really fancy 
taking it apart to fix it so I ended up practically giving it away. Wish I would have hung on to it, but we all have those kinds of regrets. So, you know, four years ago, I, I decided, you know, I want one of these things. And before that, you know, I'd seen the prices going up and I figured, well, now is the time to get one. They show up occasionally. Four years ago, they did. And they didn't go for that much money. You know, a thousand US is still a lot of money for a non-functioning drive. But nowadays, what, a couple grand for a non-functioning one? It's crazy. So... You know, I won it and I was happy, but it needed work. So um, now I put it on the bench and took it apart. Uh, first thing I wanted to do, or first thing that I did, well, before I start, I'm already done the repair. So I'm not going to be doing it on camera. Um, I took pictures along the way. They're going to be showing up up here as I went through them and described the process makes the video a little bit quicker. I don't need this thing to drag on forever, neither do you. So the first thing I wanted to do was um, kind of compartmentalize the repair. I wanted to test the power supply, make sure that thing didn't go up in a puff of smoke when I plug it in. I wanted to test to see if the hard drive would spin up and what it sounded like. And then I wanted to see if the logic boards were to power up on their own and if I could get a response from the old pet from it. If I could, then that would indicate that it has some life. So first thing I did was hooked up the power supply, disconnected everything inside and powered that on, no smoke. I checked the voltages, um, five volts on the five volt line and 12 volts on the 12 volt line. Um, I checked the technical specs and the voltages were within the tolerances set forth in the specifications for the power supply. So I was good on the power supply. Then I plugged the Tandon hard drive. It's a five and a quarter inch full height um, hard drive. Five megs of storage is, yeah, I believe it has a higher capacity, but five megs is all this, that this thing will format out of it. So I hooked that up, turned it on, it powered up, it sounded okay. You know, it didn't sound growly or grindy or, or it spun up nice uh, in, you know, roughly the time frame. It usually takes about what, 10 seconds, up to 10 seconds to power up, to spin up. And so that sounded okay. I let the thing run for a while. Um, now. I never had planned, even if it had worked, I never had planned on leaving that in there. Uh, it's an old MFM drive, but you know, it's always exciting to see what kind of uh, data is on a drive from 40 years ago. Um, so anyway, I powered that up, spun up fine. So that was fine. I was happy. The power supply is working. Hard drive spun up. Didn't know if it worked, but it spun up. No smoke. Now the the big thing was the next thing I did was I disconnected the hard drive and plugged power into the the two logic boards. The bottom board is the SASE board, and that's the SASE is the predecessor to SCSI. Uh, SASE came first, and SCSI came next, and um, so that one takes a 12 volt and 5 volt line. And then on top of that is the DOS board. And that plugs in with a 50 pin ribbon cable, just like, you know, SCSI. So you can see where the connection is. And uh, that DOS board takes a five volt line. So I hooked those up, uh, took an IEEE cable, hooked it up to the PET and powered it on. So just the logic boards, the two logic boards print DS string on the uh, the pet and lo and behold it reported DOS 3. Yay! I was so happy. Um, that meant that there was no work to do, probably no work to do, on either the SASE or the DOS board and it was a matter of getting a hard drive to work in it. Now 
after I had discovered that um, this thing had taken a face plant, I was already thinking about a replacement hard drive, but after I saw the damage on the face, I thought, yeah, I'm going to have to find a replacement. So poking around on, on the internet a bit, I discovered um, people were saying that an S, a Seagate ST225 MFM drive, it's a half height, full, five and a quarter inch drive, that would be compatible with the controllers, the controller, the SASE and the DOS board in here. So I started shopping around again on eBay, where else do we find this stuff? And uh, bought one. The guy said, yeah, it worked, you know. So I paid him money, got delivered, had an old AT, uh, an old 286 machine, you know, those big old flat desktop ones and hook that up to the MFM controller in there. Nothing, it's dead. So told the guy, he said, no problem. Gave me my money back. Off I was shopping again. Uh, found another one. Told the guy the story. Listen, I need one that works. He said, no problem. I have one. I tested it myself. Works 100% guaranteed or you get your money back. All right, send it. So I bought it. He sent it, hooked it up nothing dead so he was he was very gracious about it he refunded me so now i had two drives dead ones and shopping again so uh i started looking found another one guaranteed working seemed at the time everything was guaranteed to work bought that one they were all around 80 bucks something like that a piece so i Bought that one, it arrived, hooked it up, and the thing is loud, like growling, noisy. It just sounded terrible, but it did work. And, you know, ultimately the goal um, in getting an MFM drive for this thing was to see if those boards work. Um, again, I never had any intention of leaving an MFM drive in here because I had this fanciful idea of using uh, an SD card interface board um, to replace the MFM drive. Um, in my hunting for these um, old MFM drives, I did come across one particular site. Um, the guy sold uh, a device called a DREM and uh, they're located in British Columbia in Canada. So not too far away from me. So that was kind of in the back of my mind. Uh, maybe I could go that route, um, especially, you know, if I couldn't get these hard drives to work. So, of course, that was four years ago. So I, uh, I of course, those drives got put away. This guy got put away on a shelf and forgotten for the longest time. And uh, so, of course, this year I decided, hey, I'm going to get this thing going. I want this hooked up to my pet. I want to be able to load my games and whatever on it whenever I want to play on my pet. I want to use something old, you know, an old drive like this. So the next thing, once I took this thing off the shelf, was to find those old hard drives. Now, where had I put them? I did manage to locate two, um, two of the MFM drives. I couldn't remember where the third one was. I didn't remember which was which. So I pulled the cables out, unhooked them off the tendon, hooked them onto the side, or onto, onto the side of the drive. I uh, put the drive beside the, um, the 9060, powered it up, <clears throat> and it wouldn't format. Got a bad disc, so uh, that drive was no good. It was one of the dead ones. So then I tried the second one. It's like, oh, maybe the second one is one of the good ones. Why well, I didn't get rid of the dead drives back then? Whatever. I don't know. Tried the second drive. No go. Same problem. It was, it was also a dead drive. Then I go hunting for the third one. You think I can find that anywhere? No. Um... So I was 
poking around boxes and I came across an old mini scribe drive. And uh, that one was a, I think it was a 20 meg out of uh, an old 2000 that I had. Um, and when I pulled that thing out back when and put it in the box, the drive did work. So I thought, well, I never seen anybody hook a mini scribe up to this thing, but I got nothing to lose. So let's give it a try. I hooked it up and lo and behold, it worked. I was able to format the, the mini scribe. I got my 19,000 blocks free and I was happy. But now, now the problems arise because <clears throat> the uh, the tenant drive that's installed in there, it's installed upside down underneath the two logic boards, the SASE and the DOS board. And the reason why they installed it upside down, I always wondered why would you install a hard drive upside down, especially those old things. I mean, I remember having problems back in the 90s with these things if you installed them sideways and you never ever installed these things upside down. So why would they do that? Well, they did that for a reason. And the reason is the hard drives of the time, the old five and a quarters, they had mounting points on the sides of the drives, but they also had four points on the bottom of the drive. So the drive could be screwed down from the bottom rather than from the sides. And what Commodore did was they installed the tandem drive upside down so that they could take advantage of those four holes. They're threaded holes, you know, of course for screws. And what they did was they put um, four posts on, four threaded posts on those because the drive is upside down. And then with little spacers and screws, they mounted the logic boards to the underside of the drive. So that causes a problem. If you if you have any plans on installing a three and a half inch hard drive in here, you're gonna have trouble because it needs a five and a quarter inch um, half height or full height hard drive in there to mount the logic boards to. So that presented kind of a, a big problem because I would have to do one of two things um, if I were to want to install something three and a half i would have to design a 3d design amount print it plastic and then with heat sets and and all in the correct location so i could mount the board in the right place and the board has to be in a very specific place because it has to be stacked with certain spacing and it has to be an exact location because the end of the dos board at the back of the drive is where the IEEE connector is and that has to line up with the opening at the back of the case at a very specific location and height. You get that when you mount the boards to the underside of the tendon. If you make any adjustments incorrectly, it's nothing's going to line up, nothing's going to fit. All right, so we're going to get back to that in a little bit because that's going to become important. I just wanted to make you aware of how these boards are mounted inside and it'll be important in a little bit. Um, so anyway, back to the restoration. <clears throat> so we have the, the drive. Um, it's all working. It works fine with the mini scribe. So now it was time to decide what kind of drive am I going to put in this thing? And uh, I need to learn more about these, this DOS board and the SASE board um, because I still wanted to use that DREM. I wanted to use a, a solid state board, um, which is used in a lot of different things. Uh, Commodore CMD stuff, you can put those um, SD to SCSI boards. Amigas use them a lot. Um, so I wanted that same concept. I wanted to have one of those those little PCBs with a with the SD card slot and except this one would hook up to the MFM cables inside. Um, so back four years ago, I had contacted the people at DREM and asked them, 
have you guys ever sold one of these to anybody that installed it into one of these drives? And they said, no, nobody ever has. But they said that we'll work with you if you want to try it. And if it doesn't work, um, we'll give you your money back. And But they said, we think it will. It's like 99% chance we can get it working and we'll work with you. So I said, okay, when I do this, I'll contact you again. Of course, and four years went by and I, I figured, well, somebody in the community must have bought one of these things. It's a cool board. It's expensive, but it's cool. Um, so I reached out to them again, asked them, same question. Hey, has anybody hooked up one of these to 9060 or 9090? They said, nope. No commoner guys, just being PC guys, Amiga guys, you know, those are, so, but they said, offer still stands, you want to buy one? We'll help you get it working. I said, done, let's do it. So I ordered it, a few days later, my Dremel was here, uh, and uh, we got to work on it. Um, so I, I take this thing apart, I pull the, the tendon hard drive out, and um, because that thing's got to go and somehow inside I'm going to have to install the DREM when I get it working so that's kind of going through my mind um, as I'm going and I had an idea I thought well since I need to have a hard drive you, it's designed to have an old MFM drive in there why don't I take one of those old ST225s that I've got that are dead, strip the thing down to a bare frame, and then design a mount to, to hang the drum underneath it. So that was the plan. I stripped out one of the ST225s, <clears throat> just installed the frame in there, mounted the logic boards, and it worked. It held the boards in the perfect location. I'm very happy with that idea. So that's what I did. I took the tendon out, um, mounted the logic boards back in, and, uh, and then we started work on it. Now, the DREM is uh, it's a very cool device. How it works is you have uh, your basic um, DREM configuration, and then you have a drive configuration and a drive file. And then there are some other ancillary files in there. But the, um, the two important things in there are the config file for the DREM and the drive configuration. And in the drive configuration, that's where you set all of the values that you'd find on the specification sheet in the 9060 or 9090 manual. And that's, uh, so that's where you put that. And then um, when I worked with the, the folks at DREM, I had to enable some log um, log files so that it would build log files as as we were doing the testing. Um, so that's kind of the configuration that we did um, with it. I'll pop up on the screen here uh, the values that we chose. Uh, it took a couple couple of attempts, but it was only two attempts, and we got this thing working as a ninety sixty. So. Um, Anybody going with a DREM in the future is going to be able to take advantage of the work that the DREM folks and myself did uh, because those configuration files and the, um, the drive file um, are now installed, not installed, they are also included in the sample configurations uh, when they sell the DREM. So you're not going to have to go through all of this. So the next thing, after I got it working as a 9060, I'd been doing a ton of reading. And I read that there really is no difference between a 9060 and a 9090 other than the physical hard drive and a configuration setting in it. Now, out on the internet, we know that there isn't always great information or accurate information. And some of the information that I came across was wrong about how to configure this for a 9060 or 9090. Um, one site mentioned, uh, 
a J13 and J14 and you had to use a certain combination. Uh, some, some places said, oh, you just have to jumper J14. Um, so it's kind of conflicting. In the, uh, the manual for the 9060 that you can find online, um, in there, there is a specific spot that says um, when you're replacing, it's for kind of a service technician, when you're replacing the the DOS board, it if it's a 9060, no, if it's a 9090, they say, jumper J14. So I tried that. I jumper J14, and then I adjusted the number of heads in the drive configuration from four to six. The um, number of cylinders is the same between the 9060 and the 9090. So that's the only change that you need to do in the configuration. Of course, if you're talking physical drives, the physical drive has to have three platters for 9090 and two platters for 9060 or four or six heads. So I made that change in the configuration file after um, I got the 9060 working, formatted it, and it worked. I got 29, over 29,000 blocks free. So I was pretty happy about that. Um, so I've, I've obviously left the configuration in this machine as a, uh, a 9090 to take advantage of that extra space. Um, so yeah, so that's the configuration that I went with, uh, the, uh, the mount that I came up with going back to where we were with that, that frame, I had, I designed a mount. It's a 3d printed thing with heat sets. When I had stripped out all the components off the ST225, I, uh, I utilized the, the location on the underside or on the, yeah, on the top side, it's mounted upside down. The location where the motor was, and there were three um, screw holes, 120 degrees apart, that held the motor in place. And I thought, well, that's gonna be a good spot to mount the DREM because it's far enough back in the case that the cables don't have to go so far and it's close enough that I can plug in a keyboard and monitor. And, uh, that's going to be a, become important in a little bit here. Um, so I did that. I designed the mount. Um, it worked out really well. The mount fit really nice in that opening. Um, the drum fit really nice on there. It held it at the right spot. I was very pleased with how that turned out. And uh, it allowed me to hook up the cables to the, the sassy and the, or yeah, to the sassy board. That's where those cables go to. And uh, <clears throat> so after that, that after that was installed, then I had to decide on power because there was no way I was leaving that ancient 220 volt power supply. I pulled it out and the underside of the boards were black, obviously from way too much heat, having been run way too long. Uh, and the cooling wasn't sufficient, obviously. Uh, so I wanted to replace that with something more modern. What I ended up uh, replacing it with was um, Meanwell power supply. Um, the specifications in, uh, in the 9060 and 9090 technical manual was that it needed five volts at six amps and 12 volts at two amps, but it needed to be able to surge to five amps for 10 seconds. And that five amp surge was for when the tendon started spinning up. Now, knowing that I'm not using a tendon anymore and that DREM draws very little power, that requirement was negated. So I chose a meanwhile power supply with the specifications of six or five volts, six amps. So that matches the five volt requirement, which is for all the logic boards in there. So that makes sense. And I went with 
12 volts at 3 amps. So that's an amp more. Um, I am going to also be replacing the fan in here, which I did. And uh, that'll be a 12 volt fan too. So I figured, well, that's, that's going to work out well. So it's a switching power supply, very efficient, um, doesn't throw out a ton of heat. And uh, so that got installed into the case. I ran new wiring for the, the to power the drum that needed a little bit longer cable. Uh, the cable that went up to the sassy board and the cable that went up to the DOS board. And then uh, the only other connection would be for the fan. Uh, 12 volts I ran to the back of the machine um, and utilized the same connections. The, the power plug where the the line voltage comes in, the fuse remained the same because power supply was virtually identical, and the power switch. So that all worked out really well. Had uh, the fan. The fan on this thing was a 220 volt fan and the thing sounded like a jet fighter spinning up. Obviously I'm not running 220 on this thing anymore, so, but it's an 80, was an 80 mil fan and uh, they're still standard. And so I ended up using a Noctua 80 millimeter fan and uh, remarkably, the screw mounts are exactly the same between the fans from back then and this fan today. So I was able to use the little rubber connecting pin things that it comes with and just pop it through and held it on the back. It's a nice uh, shock free mount. So there isn't any vibrations from the fan and it fit really well. I took one of the harnesses, chopped the end off, stripped it back for verified that it was blown the right way. And it was 12 volts hooked that into the power supply and that worked. So essentially that, that was um, the restoration of it. Uh, the drive works really well. I'm going to uh, power it up for you right now and you can see. Okay, so those two beeps tell you that the, um, the drum is up and running. Now on the tandem drives there or any MFM drive there's always a uh, spin up time that before the drive comes up to speed and stabilizes um, and they usually say that's about 10 seconds this drum also needs to boot up because it's, it's a, you know it's an electronic device that you know that has to boot up obviously it's it's a little mini computer of its own so that needs some time to boot up doesn't take as long as the uh, the hard drive so those two beeps tell you that it's up and running so that's all you have to wait for. We have a green light here. And uh, so now I can do a little catalog. And you can see, there it is. I have a, a whole bunch of different files installed on here. I got 12 disks of games and I don't know, maybe three or four utility disks. Separate them all with, with little dividers. You can, I don't know if you can see in the video. But the drawback of the 9060 is that, which is DOS 3, which is there's no um, facility for subdirectories. So everything goes into the root. As you can see, it scrolls for a really long time. And it's, this still has almost 21,000 blocks free. And it's just over 29,000 blocks formatted. So you can fit a lot of stuff on here. I didn't even think that there were 12 discs of games for the pet, but apparently there's still, there's plenty of stuff out there for it. Um, back to the DREM a little bit and the configuration. Um, the, uh, the DREM itself, in order to monitor the, uh, the format and what it's doing, uh, you have the ability of hooking up uh, 
VGA monitor to it and a keyboard so you can control the DREM, you can do various settings. When I went from a 9060 to a 9090, um, obviously the disk size changed and that generated an error um, that I was able to see on the VGA screen. Um, that was easy to resolve. You just press zero on the keyboard that shows you all the specs of the uh, of the drive that you've configured for this and then you just do control s and return to save the new uh, drive size and and that's it that that was that's how you clear that error um, one other interesting thing with being able to see what the drive is doing through the drum display is i was able to see what the drive was doing um, because it takes a long time to format I mean it it takes an hour and a half to format five megs on this yeah that's a long time to format five megs so I was curious what was it doing and this curiosity kind of led me down this whole rabbit hole um, of stuff that I'm going to talk about next and it's really um, things that I want to do in the future with it I did a little bit of experimenting and it's kind of interesting stuff so um, first of all this hour and a half format why does it take an hour and a half to format 153 cylinders and four heads well it takes that long because when you issue the header command on your pet it starts formatting starting at track 0 1 2 3 4 all the way up to 153 and then it starts counting back down to 0 so it's formatting up to 153 then back down to 0 and it does that three times so it formats the 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 drive six times when you format it that's why it takes so long the 9090 took 2 hours and 15 minutes to format that's insane. So I started thinking about um, the flexibility of the DREM. The DREM has the capability of supporting up to 16 heads and 2048 tracks. So you probably know where I'm heading to now. I started looking around and uh, I discovered that around, I'm going to turn this thing off because it's a little noisy. I started looking around and around 1988 there was a German company that was offering 9060s and 9090s for sale but they were upgraded they had up to 16 megabytes of storage and dual drives so that started get me thinking what else can I do with this thing when I had this thing apart and I had taken, of course, I took the DOS board and the SASE board out. I saw on the SASE board there was another set of pin headers on there, the same size as the drive, drive zero connector. So I thought, I wonder if I can add a second drive. So like a drive zero and drive one. So I tried it. I duplicated the configuration settings um, for the drive zero. I just copied it and then renamed it to drive one. I talked to the guys at Drem, they said, yeah, that's all you need to do. And uh, booted it up, and sure enough, I had two drives. Uh, don't get too excited. You can't have it. And I'll tell you why you can't have it. I got this thing up and running. I was able to read a directory, but I right away noticed that there was a problem. I was not able to save anything to drive one. So I was talking about it on Facebook with some people and they suggested, oh, why don't you load up drive zero and then flip the configurations so that you have a whole bunch of programs on drive one then, and then you can still use drive zero. So I tried that and sure enough, that worked. Um, every time you do a catalog and then you do a catalog again, it flips where drive zero and drive one shows up. You know, you do catalog once, zero and one is here. You do catalog again that switched 
whenever that switched, your directory was corrupted. So that was a bit weird. Um, when I tried to use the drive, once I had stuff on drive one and nothing in drive zero, the directory got all corrupted. It was terrible. As it turns out, um, Commodore never implemented the second drive. Uh, the code is bad in DOS 3. It doesn't manage the second drive properly. The directory space seems to be shared between um, drive zero and drive one. Um, so it doesn't work. So yeah, you can ha you can hook it up and it'll look cool, but it's not gonna work. It's just gonna cause problems. So I kind of scratched that idea. I figured the guys, the German guys that did it back in the late eighties had probably um, modified, they disassembled the DOS and corrected the problems. Uh, I couldn't find the ROMs anywhere. They're probably around in some drive someplace maybe, um, but nothing that's ever been uncovered that I've been able to see. The second thing, which was interesting, is they were able to increase the capacity. And since the DREM is capable, as I said, of increasing the number of heads and cylinders, I thought it would be cool if we could find this. So I enlisted the help of a buddy of mine that's been helping work on some of the phantom stuff that I've been doing. And uh, I got him to do a little quick disassembly of areas on the ROM of interest. Now there are three ROMs on the DOS board. There's two ROMs at the back and one further forward. And the one further forward, it's a 2716 on mine. And that's what I call the sassy ROM. The two back ones are the DOS ROM. And the sassy ROM contains the configuration for your hard drives. And it actually contains two configurations. It contains one for drive zero and one for drive one. And I didn't a hundred percent um, track it down because at that point I had discovered um, two drives weren't possible, but it really is leaning towards that the second jumper beside J14, which is J13, is the configuration jumper for drive one. So had DOS 3 been properly implemented, you could have configured um, drive one to be a 9060, a five meg drive, and uh, the, the drive, what did I say? Drive zero could be a 9090, drive, drive one could be 9060, or whatever combination you wanted of the, those two. Um, and then I thought, well, okay, that's nice to know you don't need 13. That kind of confirms it. Um, but what I thought is, what if I, we can locate the number of heads and number of cylinders in this? So sure enough, through the dis disassembly, we we're able to locate where those values are. And there's actually two locations in the SASE ROM where you can change the number of heads. One of them has four heads in it and one has six. Those are the, the two values in those locations. So that works. And then there's only a single location because both drives share the same number of cylinders where 153 cylinders is. So looking at uh, that space in the ROM, it's possible to increase the number of heads to eight heads and it's also possible to increase the number of cylinders to 256 cylinders. So that's where they were getting 16 megabytes. So I made those changes and I got a flashing red light. Well, as it turns out, they have a little bit of protection in that ROM and it's a checksum. And if you change anything in that ROM, the checksum kicks you, kicks you out into an error. Um, we did manage to locate that routine, figured out how to turn it off. We also figured out how to recalculate it based on whatever changes that we made. So it is actually possible to correct the checksum 
increase it to eight cylinders and 256, eight heads, 256 cylinders, and get this thing to boot up. So I did that. And I was almost successful. Um, I was able to, through the DREM monitor, you know, the VGA monitor and keyboard you can hook up to this thing, um, I was able to see it formatting eight heads and I saw it go all the way up to 256 cylinders and back down, did that six times, uh, but it didn't work. <clears throat> and the DREM was kicking out a bunch of errors while I was doing that. And that's kind of as far as I took it. I know it's a little bit of a downer hearing that I didn't take it any further, but I really wanted to wrap up this project and uh, as you know, because feature creep is always a problem with a lot of the projects I do. And I really didn't want this to drag on forever. So I thought that would be a great phase two for this thing. So that's where I, where I left it. Um, I do plan on touching base with the DREM people and uh, digging into this ROM a little bit more. Um, and doing some tests, doing some logs, and sending that off to the DREM people, see if they can help eliminate some of these errors. Uh, it looked like something that they could probably fix. I mean, it was they're kind of an odd error. Anyway, I didn't want to pursue it. I had other things that I needed to do, so I kind of shelved that one. I've kept all my documentation for it, and it's something that I'm going to circle back to sooner than later. Um, and then I'll probably do another video, uh, an update to my 9060 um, that I restored. Uh, the front is still caved in on it. And I was originally going to maybe get a couple of pieces of hardwood and clamp it and bend it back. But I don't know. Maybe I'll leave it as a, a beauty mark on it to show the the struggle that the, the drive went through to remind me um, of how it came to be um, in my possession. Otherwise the drive is working really great. Um, really happy with how it turned out. The thing is super light now. You know, it's it's still a heavy metal case and but the lack of that big power supply and the lack of the big tandem hard drive uh, really makes a huge difference. The thing is nowhere near as backbreaking to lift as it was originally. And the thing is bulletproof. I mean, of course, it has two giant logic boards, the SASE and the DOS board, and they're all running old TTL logic chips, so any one of those could die at any time. I mean, they're 40 years old, over 40. So, yeah. Will it last forever? No. But will it last longer than if I would have put an MFM drive in? Absolutely. The DREM is really wonderful. I do highly recommend it. Um, I wasn't paid to, to say this. I paid my own hard-earned money to buy one of these things, and it was absolutely worth it. Yeah, it's $299 US. Um, and then I do recommend if you get one of these, get the MFM cables with it. It saves you hunting around and you've got some brand new cables rather than using dusty old aged cracked MFM cables from the eighties. So that's it. Um, that's my 9060, which is now uh, operating as a 9090 supplying me with tons of different programs and lots of space to add more. And uh, that's about it. If you've got any questions about the restoration or if I left something out and I wasn't clear enough, then uh, leave a message in the comments and I'll be happy to answer your questions. That's it for today. I appreciate you watching this through to the end. And uh, if you do um, like the content that I'm providing, please do subscribe and uh, like it if you like it. If you don't like it, thumbs down. It helps the algorithm either way. So thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time on 8-Bit Resurgence. Bye for now.